Good morning, everyone. Please make yourselves comfortable. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for your presence this morning. It's a pleasure to be with all of you as we gather to reflect on the life of Father Thomas Berry and the significance of his contributions today, 20 years after the publication of the great work. And this convening would not have been possible without the efforts of a number of individuals and organizations. And so before we formally begin, I'd like to offer some words of gratitude. First to John Borelli, who leads our office's efforts on Catholic identity and dialogue, and Sam Wagner, who together led the organization of this conference. To Tom Banchoff, our Vice President for Global Engagement. Father Leon Hooper, who directs our Woodstock Theological Center Library. Father Leo Lefebure, our Matteo Ricci Chair and Professor of Theology. Diane Apostolos Capadona, the HAUB Director of our Catholic Studies Program. And Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, Coordinators of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. It's great to have you all with us this morning. I'd like to also acknowledge our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, led by Sean Casey, for their contributions. Sean provided invaluable support to this conference, along with his colleagues who serve as senior fellows at the Berkeley Center and members of our faculty at our School of Foreign Service. And three, I'd like to identify our Father David Hollenbach, our Pedro Arupe Distinguished Research Professor, Father Drew Christensen, Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Human Development, and Catherine Marshall, Professor of the Practice. All of you have done such great work putting together this rich set of conversations and for allowing us to reflect over the, on the time that we have together today on the living legacy of Thomas Berry. We're all the beneficiaries of Father Berry's contributions, his insights, his mentorship, his collaborations, have helped to define new fields of study and approaches to scholarship. He has inspired engagement in interreligious dialogue, in ecology, in the study of religions, and he has helped to shape the vocabulary that we use to think about our relationship to our environment, to the planet, to our larger universe. Over the course of our time together today, we'll hear from colleagues who will share their reflections on his life and legacy, his insights into cultures, religions, and ecology, his connections to Teilhard de Chardin and the journey of the universe, to Laudato Si, and many of his works and writings throughout his life. We gather today 20 years after the great work and a decade after Father Barry's passing. He provides for us invaluable resources as we face the urgent and moral challenge how do we protect our threatened planet? How do we respond to the call of Laudato Si, set forth four years ago by the Holy Father, Pope Francis? To use words inspired by Father Barry, we acknowledge that there is an ever-pressing need to take up the work of unity within our Earth community. This past month in Rome, we have seen this unity at work in the Synod of Bishops for the Pan-Amazon region the Amazonian Synod. Indigenous leaders, representatives from other religious traditions, advocates for the land, were invited to be present as observers to the dialogue centered around interconnectedness of people in the region and the care of their common home in Amazonia. Pope Francis in his homily at the opening of the Synod spoke of the fire that animates faith contrasting this with the fire that continues to blaze today in the Amazon and the dangers of colonialism and greed with another kind of kindling, the fire that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, and I quote, the fire of God is warmth that attracts and gathers into unity. It is fed by sharing, close quote. And he tells us, Quote, as we see from the story of the burning bush, God's fire burns yet does not consume. It's the fire of love that illumines, warms, and gives life, not a fire that blazes up and devours. Close quote. 
When we reflect on the life and the work of Thomas Berry, the same fire is present. In an early chapter of the great work, Father Berry writes words that have a great resonance with our moment and our ecological challenges. And I quote, here I would suggest that the work before us is the task not simply of ourselves, but of the entire planet and all its component members. Every member of the body must bring about the healing. So now the entire universe is involved in the healing of the damaged earth and the light and warmth of the sun. Close quote. So today, animated by the light and warmth of the sun, we celebrate the work of Thomas Berry. I'd like to thank all of you for your presence and your participation in our conversation today and for the ways that we will continue our dialogue around Father Berry and the great work. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues who are on, on our panel. And first, uh, uh, Professor Peter Fan, our Alacaria Chair of Catholic Social Thought, to begin our panel conversation on Thomas Berry's intellectual journey cultures, relig religion, and ecology. Peter? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, as he really told us this morning, we have the panel on Thomas Berry's intellectual journey, cultures, religions, and ecology. We have three speakers. I will introduce each of them, not together, but one by one, so that we have a little break in between. They're supposed to speak for 20 minutes, and uh, John Borelli has promised me a Rolex that he bought in Rome off the street, <laughs> so I can keep the time more accurately. 20 minutes. Yeah. And then give him a break and give yes. him a couple of minutes to five minutes to finish. Yes. Gerald, the first speaker is Gerald Carney, whom I knew about 40 years ago, um, so it shows us how old we are now. He is Professor of Religion Emeritus at Ham the Hamden Sydney College in Virginia. After being seduced into the study of Sanskrit by Thomas Berry, Jerry's initial research was on the theological impact of Vaishnava Hindu devotional drama. His later work concerned Vaishnava aesthetics and an early Vaishnava mission to convert the West. For the last 40 years, he has documented in word and image the threatened spiritual ecology of Vrindaban, India. He currently lives in Lynchburg, Virginia, with his wife, Dr. Ellen DeLuca, and their son, Peter. So, welcome. You have 20 minutes. You also speak in the name of Dan Sheridan as well. So, let him begin. I, I play two roles. Uh, Dan Sheridan, who was one of the closest collaborators with Thomas Berry, was unable to be with us. Uh, his voice needed to be heard, so he provided some text. Uh, Dan pro uh, produced two major books, one about the Advaitic theism of the Bhagavata Purana, the second, a Christian commentary on the Narada Bhakti Sutras uh, with that. He, uh, his career was at Loyola University of New Orleans, where he was both a teacher and administrator, and later uh, he completed his career at St. Joseph College of Maine. Dan begins, to, I, I'm going to read exactly what he said with one exception. There was one passage that he put into a footnote that was too good to leave out. Uh, uh, so in faith, fidelity to him, I'm going to add that. He begins, but what does it mean? An appreciation of Father Thomas Berry, Passionist by Daniel Sheridan. I meet people who laud Thomas Berry, who lived from 1914 to 2009 as the bard of the new cosmology. Each seizes upon some facet of the accomplishments of this great man. I was privileged to know him both as Father Thomas and as Thomas, as a teacher and mentor and as a peer. I owe him a deep debt of gratitude. Thomas married me and my wife 
and baptized our first son. He was the great master of, in our intellectual journey. For 42 years until his death in 2009, we talked about books he encouraged me to read. I met Thomas in 1967, roughly halfway through his journey as a scholar. I met him as he was building the intellectual foundation for the universe story, co-authored with Brian Swim in, in 1992, and then the great work, Our Way into the Future, in 1999. Attending to these foundations deepens understanding of his later work. I wish I had known him earlier, in the more formative years when he read his way through Augustine, when he was deeply informed by the Thomists of his youth, Joseph Gret and Aimé Forrest, and by the Thomistic historian Etienne Josson. I wish I had been there when, as a young teacher, at the same high school seminary I later attended, he tried unsuccessfully, Dan inserts a question mark there about unsuccessfully, to get seminarians to read the City of God and the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> On the day we met, when I was a college junior, we talked about the relationship of religion and culture found in the works of Christopher Dawson, who lived from 1889 to 1962. It gave me a leg up that I had already read Dawson. As he did for many, Thomas encouraged me to study the religions of Asia. Thus, four years later, he guided my doctoral study in the history of religions. I was also appointed his assistant at the foundation of the Riverdale Center for Religious Research. I remember the hot afternoons when, in wash tubs, we moved his library to clear the old house for renovation as the Riverdale Center. Thomas and I, under the supervision of Father Ernie Hotz, spent days knocking down old plaster walls. During that first summer, with him in 1971, each morning I studied Sanskrit. Each evening, he brought me books. McNeil's The Rise of the West, Beckett's Endgame, Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy, Augustine's The City of God, Sosenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, Vandeleur's Religion in Essence and Manifestation, Fumulan's History of Chinese Philosophy, Newman's The Great Mother, and de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. His attention was already on the environment. We read Barry Commoner's The Closing Circle and du Bois's So Human an Animal. I helped Thomas plan his week-long summer conferences. The countercultural, symbolism, New York as sacred city, sorry, Washington, uh, <laughs> energy, its cosmic human dimension. In class, Thomas introduced me to Lady Murasaki, to Confucius and Mencius, saying no one should call themselves educated if they have not met Mencius. And Lauza, the Buddha, Shankara and Krishna, Black Elk and Tayar. Somehow he missed Muhammad. I think it was deliberate. He <laughs> encouraged me never to forget Thomas Aquinas. He directed my dissertation on the Bhagavata Purana. He stressed the importance of divine affectivity and how to make comparisons in similarity and difference. He persistently asked, but what does it mean? Amazingly, and still to my surprise after all these years, he affirmed me as a young scholar. He told me to write my entire dissertation before showing it to him. It took four months of translating and writing. He encouraged my career as professor of the history of religions. From 1984 to 1996, each winter, I spent two weeks with him translating and writing. At the close of the center in 1997, he gave me a good portion of his library on Hinduism and Buddhism. For our last meeting, my wife, Marianne, Brian Brown, and Amaro Cotillo visited him in Greensboro, North Carolina. 
He had had a stroke and was a aphasic. He couldn't read, but he could remember. He remembered passages for me to read aloud from Aquinas' Summa Contra Gentiles. As a historian of religion, I learned three things from Thomas. One, the world religions have conflicting soteriologies. They include not only contraries, but contradictories. Thus, Thomas never spoke of convergent ways to the center. For the next 40 years, this conclusion placed me at odds with prevailing currents in the theology of religions. Only with the emergence of comparative and contrastive theology under the influence of Frank Clooney, SJ, have countervailing assumptions been given a hearing. As Thomas said, if God were to speak, why would he always say the same thing? <laughs> Culture and religion are inextricably entwined. Thomas worked from the style of cultural history of Christopher Dawson, who wrote in Religion and Culture, therefore, from the beginning, the social way of life, which is culture, has been deliberately ordered and directed in accordance with the higher laws of life, which are religion. As the powers of heaven rule the seasons, so the divine powers rule the life of man and society. And for a community to conduct its affairs without, paying uh, without reference to these powers seems as irrational as for a community to cultivate the earth without paying attention to the course of the seasons. The complete secularization of social life is a relatively modern and anomalous phenomenon. Throughout the greater part of mankind's history, in all ages and states of society, religion has been the great central unifying force in culture. It has been the guardian of tradition, the preserver of the moral law, the educator and the teacher of wisdom. Thus, Thomas maintained that the problematic of the present is cultural and religious, not just theological. There was nothing basically wrong with the classical theology of God. Characteristically, he bragged he had never read anything by Karl Rahner. The third point, I learned go deeper in theology and the study of religion and not to innovate when not necessary. Ewart Cousins also taught me that Paul Ricoeur was naive about second naivete since there was nothing naive about first naivete. Depth need not be achieved by innovation. Thomas's point was that the specific was as important, more important than the generic. His later development of an echozoic spirituality, which while not completely dismissive of, is at least inattentive to the redemption I am more wary of. I think it is unfortunate that those encountering Thomas Berry in his later years, after his retirement from Fordham, may not know Thomas's intellectual development from the 30s to the 70s. His later vision had a foundation. Augustine's The City of God is central to Thomas's historical perspectives with its emphasis on the biggest picture possible, on convergent historical factors, and on cultural impact. He loved its Latin periodic sentences. With Augustine, Thomas searched for the broad unfolding of human and cosmic history. He encountered the entanglement of the divine and the human. He wanted to know where history was going. This emphasis on Augustine explains why Dawson influenced him, although he rarely cited him. Dawson understood that religion was the key to understanding culture. When Thomas called himself a cultural historian, he meant culture in the sense that Dawson did, not in the anthropological sense of Krober and Cluckhorn 
or the French Annale School of Cultural History. His dissertation at Catholic University in 1948 on Vico, who lived from 1668 to 1744, illustrates this. Basically, an exposition of Vico's thought, it might not pass muster these days as a dissertation, but it shows the direction of Berry's thought and his practice as a cultural historian. In the early 50s, he studied the great Neo-Confucians, especially Chu Shi in the 12th century of our era. This is important because Thomas juxtaposed Neo-Confucian cosmic humanism dialectically with Augustine's and Aquinas' monotheism of creation. In the later 50s, he discovered Teilhard, who synthetically pulled the two strands together. From this convergence, Thomas derived the basis for his environmental and ecological work, even while he was very critical of Teilhard. Thomas, in the 40s and 50s, should be situated as a historian of thought, and then from the 70s on, as an essayist of genius, he had found his genre. Unfortunately, Thomas never produced a major historical work. Nonetheless, his insights are shaped by the essay, which may be the perfect vehicle for what he wanted to say, for the audience he wanted to reach, and for the way he wanted to impact that audience. He appreciated other essayists, Emerson, Annie Dillard, René Dubois, Wendell Berry, sometimes he called him Cousin Wendell, but that wasn't accurate. <laughs> That's me, uh, Tayar, et cetera. The essay, with his carefully crafted prose and poetic resonance, channeled and focused his teaching. What he wanted to convey, he wrote in lucid prose that he reviewed again and again. He also delivered these essays in spoken form, usually he stayed close to the text. His phases and modes of thought were repeated, even as they unfolded over the decades. He was not into the academic games of publication and scholarship, nor into the intricacies of detailed research. He read foundational texts directly, Augustine in Latin, Chu Shi in Chinese, the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit, and then the Communist Manifesto, Teilhard, Jung, etc. Many of the dissertations of his doctoral students were about significant Hindu and Buddhist texts and about Native American myths and rituals and what they now mean. This approach allowed him to read the ancients as if he and they were contemporaries. Their thought addressed him directly in the present. Thus, he did not get bogged down too much in historical contextualization. This is both a gain and a loss. It means that his major conclusions may be on the mark, but his historical illustrations may fall short. Historians may be impatient with him from a more focused historical point of view, rightly so, but in terms of the big picture, perhaps not. Thanks to Kathleen O'Gorman in the 80s, Thomas came to Loyola University in New Orleans over six years to teach weekend graduate courses for the Institute for Ministry. We celebrated there his 80th birthday. In 2000, all the faculty of St. Joseph's College of Maine received copies of the great work, and a required course for all students was introduced, entitled Ecology and the Environmental Challenge. During the 90s at Riverdale, Thomas and I discussed Thomas Aquinas' philosophy of the analogy of being and creation out of nothing. These discussions show that in his last years in private conversations, he was very interested in the most important questions from his earliest studies as a seminarian. Is the universe self-explanatory or not? Yet he rarely alludes to this question in his later essays. Creation was a doctrina arcana. As a historian, he developed the thesis that Christianity since the Black Death, the Reformation, and the Counter-Reformation 
overemphasized redemption at the expense of creation. This, he thinks, contributed to the ecological crisis. In my judgment, the thesis is stated, but never demonstrated with convincing historical evidence according to contemporary historiographical criteria. I am not sure I support this thesis. In fact, I know I don't. However, I think it can be sorted out of his thought without losing its overall value and impact. He would not have agreed with me about this. This is the strength and weakness of Thomas Berry as a historian. He was an essayist and direct reader of texts. He was a humanist in the classical sense that Vico and Dawson, even as he resituated the human project into the universe story, the basic mood of the future might well be one of confidence in the continuing revelation that takes place in and through Earth. In this last, he joined Teilhard in fundamental Christian hope. Let us say thank you in some fashion to Dan Sheridan for sharing all of, of this. Now, they, they promised me a, an opportunity to speak in my own voice, not in Dan's, to this. Um, I, I am some, was something of an anomaly. I went to Fordham uh, in 19, 1969 in the fall. Coming out of the seminary, I hadn't taken the GREs. And without those scores, they wouldn't let me into the program. They said I could take one course. So I took the one course I knew I couldn't transfer. And that was Thomas Berry's introduction to the history of religions. Uh, I never throw anything out, unfortunately. And I went back over uh, the notes that I took during that semester. And I recognized all of the things that he was opening us up to in the course of that. Along the way, he invited, if anybody wants to learn Sanskrit, stay around after class. I can't. <laughs> and fool that I was. I don't know what I was thinking. I went along and, and did that. And the next semester, I took another course with Thomas and a course with, with Ewart Cousin that he co-taught. And went, it was the beginning, beginning of, of, of the story. And while I didn't have those two-week sessions uh, to speak to Thomas that Dan had, Dan and I have had an ongoing conversation for the last 20 years or more, recognizing how differently he and I appropriate traditions and how we work back and forth with that and so on. As you'll see in the next couple of minutes, Dan is far more rigorous than I am and incisive. And I'm more opening my hands to see what I can receive and then playing with all of these things over time, some of which begin to fit in right now but may have to wait till later, some of which are foregrounded and then backgrounded along the way, but a very different sense of, of, of learning. But both of us learn from Thomas. I would go over to see him. and. What, even though I'm talking in public now, I am a real introvert. And I'd never come up to speak with someone and say, I've got these four questions I can't wait to lay on you. And I would come up there and we'd be silent with one another. And I, I would turn to him and say, Thomas, what have you been thinking about lately? And of course, he'd tell me. He'd grab some of the Riverdale papers or something else and hand it to me. Or he dropped kind of a bomb in the midst of it, like the time he told me of the importance of Sunday football games as a ritual of our society. It, with that, I, in, in my own development, he offered these courses that brought different things together. I mean, I learned about China and Japan and Native American traditions. In addition to that, I had the opportunity in, in studying Sankara to study the Purva Mamamsa, which was before that, and gives it a different spin to it. And then as part of my master's comps, I studied the, the followers right after Shankara, who didn't leave Shankara unscathed in their discussions and all the rest. But the biggest insight in looking at the later traditions 
was that at the core of everything, there is a sense of difference and non-difference. Much of Dan's work emphasized difference. Don't smush it up. My career has been to recognize that the boundaries of God, nature, and self are porous. And therefore, there's a, 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 a smushiness, if I can coin a theological term, between these. And that recognizing difference and non-difference and participation and intimacy in all of these things is simply at the core of who we are and what our world is and what we need to be in the midst of these things. I want to suggest briefly um, with this, before Peter uh, pulls the plug uh, on this, four elements. See, when I went to study in India, I went as a documentary photographer and a theologian, both. And I'm now more that documentary historian. If I can see something, if I can catch one image, I think I can say it all. And sometimes I come close uh, to catching that. So I'm into images uh, with this. So the first of these are Mahavakyas. In the Vedanta tradition, there were only four. There actually are more than that. In Thomas Berry, there are hundreds. Right? I started off in one of his early things where he, where he says, intellectually and spiritually, everything in human life depends on the manner in which we experience the human condition, how we respond to that tradition, and whether we manage the human condition in a creative or destructive direction. In some ways, for the growth of us as people and developing spirituality, that says mostly everything. If you pin everything together and pull it that way. He wrote about differing spiritual traditions, that within the larger human world, the multiple spiritual and religious traditions implicate each other. They point to each other. And he points out that, as, Don, as Dan would agree, right, they must be kept separate, not turned into a religious smoothie or along the way, but rather that each has something to offer into this. But then he builds up to the following final line, all human traditions are dimensions of each other. And it's how to explore that and develop that becomes the challenge uh, of that. There, there are more of these mahavakyas, these main phrases that can be used to organize all of the, the writings of Thomas Berry into various forms of coherent whole uh, with that. Some of the, the, the more recent ones of the three principles of differentiation of creation, subjectivity uh, of that, and communion, the three of these interacting to explain the universe, the cosmos, the earth, and ourselves with all of this. One quotation to, to touch on this. In the emerging Echozoic era, we experience the universe as a communion of subjects, not as a collection of objects. How often we go back to that phrase, John and Mary Evelyn meant, mentioned this, this yesterday. But he goes on from that to say, we hear, so subjects, not objects. We hear the voices of all the living creatures. We recognize, understand, and respond to the voices of the crickets in the fields, the flowers in the meadows, the trees in the woodlands, and the birds all around us. All these voices resound within us as a, a universal chorus of delight and existence. Wow, right? A sense of pulling these. So that when I went to see Thomas, I'd, I'd come back filled with these things. A couple other of these symbols, okay? The Mahavakyas. The challenge of any of us is to find those, right? The finger pointing at the moon, saying nothing. Look, see, get it, move on to it. The vocation we have as wisdom keepers, to follow that along and to find a way into the, into the future. 
At the burial place for Thomas in Vermont, there was a Frederick Frank sculpture of St. Francis and the birds. Um, I couldn't find one of the pictures I took it, but if you can see up here, it's like this. It's not Francis chatting with a bird on, on his finger, but rather this ecstatic, hands up, the birds going, and with all of that. And to me, that sums up the way in which Thomas dealt with this, and I had to draw some words to describe it. That this celebratory moment, cosmic in its dimensions, is open to the whole expanse, the whole hoop of the world, a vision like black elks, seeing more than one can tell and understanding more than seeing, seeing in a sacred manner all of these things in the spirit, making up one circle, wide as daylight or as starlight, and in the center, one tree like that oak at Riverdale Center, right, that is the center of it and holy. I want to end with one final quotation. Um, when I finished my dissertation, I did it under Jose Pereira, but with Thomas having inspired the whole thing, I wanted to bring this heavy tome over and give it to him myself. And he told me, well, I'm busy tonight. There's a, a session I'm having with people about Dante's Divine Comedy. And we're, we're having a festive occasion tonight. But you can come, and after we do that. So I came, I sat by the door, and I overheard a group of people who've been making their way through the entire Divine Comedy, Infer Inferno, Purgatorio, and now they were coming to Canto 33, the last canto of the, uh, uh, of the Paradiso. And so Thomas recited it in Italian, and then they worked at it through in English. And it goes like this. As the geometer intently seeks to square the circle, but he cannot reach through thought on thought the principle he needs, so I search that strange sight of the divine presence. I wish to see the way in which our human effigy suited that circle and found place in it. But my own wings were far too weak for that. But then my mind was struck by light that flashed, and with this light received what it asked. Here, force failed my high fantasy, but my desire and will were moved already like a wheel revolving uniformly by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. L'amore che muove il sole e la stelle. The love that moves it. That image of the movement from human, humanist understanding to see the divine presence and power, right, is the gift that Thomas gives to us, to me at least, and it is one for which I'm profoundly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerald, for reading the paper of Dan Sherrod. We will give him thanks later on. And now I introduce you someone who need no introduction, and that is John Borelli. As we learned yesterday, he received his doctorate at Fordham University under the great master Thomas Berry. Um, he wrote many books, which include Evangelicals and Catholics for the Common Good, A Common Word and the Future of Christian-Muslim Relations, and Interfaith Dialogue. And he has been working at a conference of Catholic bishops, and he saw the light, and he came to Georgetown. <laughs> so we are listening to John. The only uh, uh, thing that made him know is that he's known as my younger brother. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the similarity, you see, why are they <laughs> brothers? Look at our heads, and we know the similarity. <laughs> Go on, John. Yes, thank you. Peter and I discovered we have the same birth year. You know, um, we're about the only two without emeritus or emerita after our name in this yes, conference, yes. you know. So, 
But there's hope if the oldest team in baseball can win the World Series. Yeah. On two occasions, I invited Father Thomas Berry to give addresses to very special audiences. And I was surprised on both occasions. Not so much for what he said, I expected that, but how he was so far ahead of what his audiences expected he would say. I invited him to the College of Mount St. Vincent in Riverdale, just north of the Riverdale Center, where I had landed right after Fordham. And on the 16th of March, 1977, few in the audience among my colleagues at the college were prepared to hear the new story, comments on the origin, identification, and transmission of values. The respondents were baffled. It's all a question of story, he began. We are in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. We are in between stories. The old story, the account of how the world came to be and how, it fitted into, how we fit into it is not functioning properly. We have not learned the new story. Father Thomas told me a week beforehand that he had prepared something he'd been thinking about. And in his address, he told my colleagues that their old story no longer functions in its larger social dimensions, has a limited orbit where it works to some effect, but renders our programs for knowing and living tangential. We sense some of this, and so we want to talk about values in education. But we cannot do that effectively until we get the basic story right. And he reviewed the old story around which the believing redemptive community organizes itself. He offered some well-chosen remarks about Darwin and then about cosmology. He presented a few ideas that were essential to his thinking since preparing that dissertation on Jan Battista Vico in 1948. By the way, he defended it on my wife's birth the day she was born. <laughs> and she gave birth to Stephen Thomas, as I told some of you last night. Father Thomas concluded by laying out the three values of the new story, increasing differentiation, a deepening subjectivity, and a more comprehensive communion within the total order of all that is real. The former president of the college, Sister Mary David Berry, my accomplice in getting Father Thomas for that day, understood the message. One or two others got pieces of it, like the student advisor who commented, if we just talk about respecting differentiation and subjectivity in our students, we, we could go a long ways to, to making their experience here better. Father Barry concluded by asserting that if the way of human civilization and religion was once the way of election and differentiation from others and from the earth, the way now is the way of intimate communion with the larger human community and with the cosmic earth process. As we moved into small groups, Father Thomas looked a little downcast. I'm going outside and walk around, he told me. He was on the verge of that big step in his intellectual journey, and a faculty was struggling to understand it. Eight years later, in 1985, for the 20th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, the Vatican II document on the relationship of the church to other religions, Father Thomas came to speak at the annual National Workshop on Christian Unity. He, there, in his presentation, the Catholic Church and the religions of the world, he drew attention to the anxiety underlying that document while recognizing some of its achievements. What was said with extreme caution is, however, worthy of serious consideration, he said. But he pressed the point as to how rather guardedly stated respect for religions which reflect, quote, a ray of that truth which enlightens all, is followed by scriptural references to the Gospel of John and 2 Corinthians, to Christ as the way, the truth, and the life in whom all find the fullness of religious life. 
This placement, he said, quote, betrays a certain anxiety less admission of any authentic revelatory experience outside the Christian tradition lead to a diminution of the Christian claim to integral revelation of the divine to the human community. He was right. The Vatican II diary of Yves Congar reports how the Jesuit Jean Danielou was furious when the full-blown text of Nostra Aetate was reviewed by the Doctrine Commission. They have made Christianity just one of the religions. So indeed, these were inappropriate scriptural passages. Most recognize that. It was a bit of proof texting, but it was in there to allay these fears that Thomas had perceived. Father Thomas had observed 15 years earlier within two or three years of the close of the council, that a deep insight led to Vatican II, namely that Christianity needed a new type, uh, Christians needed a new type of awareness of themselves. But unfortunately, he was bold to suggest, unfortunately, the council did not recognize the awareness that was truly needed. It was not that the council had not gone far enough, as disappointed liberals were saying and already calling for Vatican III. Rather, the council did not frame the new awareness in a large enough context. So in 1985, when asked to focus on Nostra Aetate, he agreed that its way of dealing with the interreligious issue had its own validity and was not particularly a new insight. He actually did not address Jewish relations specifically in his paper. And there are testimonies of those who were at Vatican II and from subsequent scholars that what Nostra Aetate stated with regard to Jewish relations was a considerable change, a discontinuity from the past many centuries and a recovery of an awareness lost from the earliest centuries of the church. On the other hand, Father Thomas had been for a brief period a missionary in China, and he knew the long tradition about interreligious relations, scattered through the centuries, as he said. He had studied the Christian encounter with the religions of Asia and with indigenous traditions. In fact, the section on the relations with Muslims cites a very positive 11th century papal letter to a Muslim ruler in North Africa. He probably knew the larger story that some missionaries went to Asia to learn and to respect and to witness. And he knew it better in 1985 after the council had sparked historical and theological research to revitalize the more positive aspects of that tradition. He commented on what his program at Fordham had contributed to this topic through religious studies. Quote, where we are able to identify in greater detail where these other religions reflect not only a ray of the divine light, but even floods of light illumining the entire religious life of humanity. These are instances in the tradition for support for an encompassing vision of the salvific process. But he observed that these instances were viewed then and even today as remedies for an undesirable situation. And worst of all, there is a lack of appreciation of an necessary diversity. St. Thomas Aquinas had designated diversity as necessary. Father Thomas was always happy to point out as, quote, the perfection of the universe from Thomas Aquinas. The passages show how St. Thomas demonstrated that God's goodness could not be adequately represented in one creature. For what is goodness in God is sim as simple and uniform in creatures is manifold and divided. How can Christians accept the variety of religious traditions with their revelation and truths, especially those showing up on the doorstep of ecumenical and interreligious staff in the United States? He offered five suggestions. Distinguish the microphase of membership and the macro phase of influence of all religious traditions. Identify what is unique in Christian revelation. Recognize the qualitative difference among religions and foster those differences. 
identify the creative dynamics of interreligious relations, and foster a sense of the new story of the universe as the context for understanding the diversity and unity of religions. Father Barry's sympathetic reading of the insights of other religions flowed from an appreciation of the genuine religious experiences afforded by them, a knowledge gained perusing original sources, as we have all said. He had the skills and vision to understand what the Catholic Church needed to implement Vatican II's call for interreligious dialogue. So he served a role that was not only needed, but appropriate. Most topics towards which he directed our attention for research had received little or no attention from scholars, and at times only cumbersome translations conveyed the meanings. He wanted us to give attention to these other sources of wisdom, to challenge and to complement how we had been educated thus far. Some thinkers he had studied in depth, for example, Mengzi and Jushi, as you said, but mostly he paid attention to how these traditions had developed with changing times and growing insights. One of his first pieces of, quote, his propaganda, as he referred to his mimeographed essays, that he distributed in his introduction to the history of religions was Christian humanism, in which he declared there is no non-Christian world. He distinguished a tribal isolated phase of Christianity, a smaller sectarian form, from a larger universalist Christian Christianity. The smaller Christian world is afraid of the larger Christian world. The baptized and institutionalized Christian world is familiar with itself but does, does not know how to relate to the larger Christian world. The considerable reading he had done since leaving China and finding his way to Fordham 20 years later convinced him that Christians needed genuine interaction with the larger world of religious experience, and that became the basis of that pioneering program at Fordham. He would comment on how deficient Catholic higher education was with regard to anthropological studies and cultural studies. He criti his critique revealed why he styled himself a cultural historian in those days. How different it would be if Christians could be comfortable in this larger world, for they would discover that the multiple spiritual and humanist traditions implicate each other. Each tradition is pan-human in its significance. If as Christians we assert the Christian dimension of the entire world, we must not refuse to be dimensions of the Hindu world, of the Buddhist world, of the Islamic world. Upon this human intercommunion on a global scale, he would say 50 years ago, depends the entire future of humanity. Even in that initial essay that we read, he declared that the most significant aspect of the entire human spiritual development is, quote, the secular and scientific development of humanity in the past few centuries in the West and its diffusion throughout the entire world, end of quote. None of us could comprehend then, then how decidedly he would focus on this as his intellectual journey continued. In that Christian humanism essay, he identified cer certain emphases of Vatican II and pushed them beyond the confines of how Vatican II had framed them. Quote, all humanity is the people of God. Within this universal election of God, there are the special elections to which various peoples are called. World humanism is the product of all these dis distinctive callings and gifts of the various peoples of the world. Each brings its treasure, its revelation, its living communication, its human creativity, he concluded. All are called to a second birth, the beginning of a higher illumination and transformation, which we find in the Hindu Brahman, in the Buddhist Nirvana, in the yoga Kaivalya experience, and in the Chinese Tao. One can see this approach running through those three initial published monographs, Five Oriental Philosophies, The Religions of India, and Buddhism. 
Father Barry's massive consumption of Asian religion, religious literature is evident throughout. These are not surveys by a generalist, but a series of detailed insights into how the teachings of various Asian traditions unfold along rich trails of development. It was not that he was a specialist on any one of these traditions, but he was a specialist in seeing how these traditions develop towards greater wisdom. In fact, these were not so much religious traditions as religious processes. And that was his expanded essay on a Christian humanism, the Christian process, and that he handed out, illustrating what he meant by how these traditions are not boxes, but ongoing cultural processes. Father Thomas praised how Vatican II, II chose a happy expression when it identified the Christian people as a pilgrim people. This symbol, though, was not adequately explained. These traditions are communities of people on a journey for greater wisdom, more fulfilling spiritual insight, and increasing understanding of how the divine works in their lives. Furthermore, Christianity and all these traditions are under the influence and even the control of evolutionary and revolutionary forces. Such force, forces, in his view, were transforming the world, the church, and all religious traditions. This great transformation is not by external pressures, he said, but by an inner dynamic that will not be resisted. The journey is an inner dynamic in all of these traditions. Observing rightly that the council was brought into existence by the influence of the world more than any inner development arising out of its traditional processes, he credited its best work when it responded to the urgencies of the contemporary world. I believe John O'Malley would agree. O'Malley writes at the conclusion of his most recent new book, When Bishops Meet, councils have met to deal with new, new problems and issues. They have met to deal with a changing world, even if the bishops present at the council did not fully recognize that that was what they were doing. <laughs> the failure of the church to relate to the modern world is what John the 23rd had perceived as the crisis that needed addressing. Regarding, though, Pope John's aggiornamento and adaptation and renovations, Father Barry found these terms weak and evidence of fear of what he called the real aggiornamento. There was no manifestation of a real modern mystique such as the world was looking for, he suggested. The difficulty with Christianity is that it has not been able to keep up with the revolutions that it itself has placed in motion. Father Barry's critique would expand in the next decades to the failure of Christianity and other traditions to address effectively the ecological crisis and the inability of all of us, whatever our religious colorings, to understand that the most significant journey is that of the earth community. You can see in his middle writings his own gropings on how to articulate the real issue. One of his most provocative statements back then was, quote, Vatican II addressed the deficiencies in church life due to the condemnation of modernism, but it failed to discern the deficiencies in church life due to the condemnation of naturalism. Most of us paid attention to how dealing with the former, the past condemnations of modernism, had overwhelmed the uh, implementation of Vatican II, while the real crisis the world was facing was the, implement, was the condemnations of naturalism in the past. Gaudium et Spes enthusiastically begins the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the peoples of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in these hearts. The text is often cited for its wordiness 
and it would have been just as effective had it, uh, in guiding Christians to embrace the modern world if it were two-thirds the size of the final document. However, the term creation, wherever the term appears in the text, is subordinate to an anthropological emphasis. Father Berry liked to point out that Rachel Carson published Silent Spring in 1962 as the council was getting underway. In the same weeks of the beginning of the council, the Cuban Missile Crisis nearly led the world to nuclear war. John the 23rd's 1963 encyclical, Pachman Terrace, and the council's concluding text, Gaudium et Spes, the Church in the Modern World, addresses questions of war, disarmament, international security. But neither text effectively talks about creation and its degradation. We read in the great work, the historical mission of our times is to reinvent the human at the species level with critical reflection with the community of life systems in a time developed context by means of story and shared dream experience. That is the great work of our times. The closest parallel Father Barry envisioned preceded human history, the geobiological transition that took place 67 million years ago when the period of the dinosaurs was terminated and a new biological age began. Father Thomas viewed this transition period into the 21st century as a moment of grace, as I said yesterday at the beginning. How ironic then, 51 years earlier, in his concluding paragraph in his doctoral thesis on the historical theory of Vico, he identified the weakness of a limited understanding of history as process of life, but without a concern for the future. He pointed out that for Vico, the desire to know the future was the original sin of man. Antonio Conti had advised Vico for the second edition of his Scienza Nuovo that Vico should extend his principles to embrace the future history of the world. Vico was reluctant. He distinguished between true and false religion, identifying false religions as arising out of idolatry and divination, a false science of the future. Others, mostly earlier Renaissance thinkers, Nicholas of Cusa, Giles of Viterbo, and Jean Baudin, had sought ways of religious concord and toleration, writing mystical dialogues. Vico had accustomed Father Thomas to thinking in terms of periods of history, but, he must have, but Thomas must have perceived something lacking, a major limitation. We might then consider Father Thomas's intellectual journey over the next five decades as a research for what was missing in his own tradition of Christian thought and the civilization that it had produced. As we read in one of the essays in this last collection, Evening Thoughts, he found in St. Thomas' commentary on the writings of the pseudo Dionysius that we cannot be truly ourselves in any adequate manner without all our companion beings throughout the earth. He found in Chinese traditions an emphasis on the continuity between the human and the cosmic. He was greatly impressed by the cosmic person of the Vedas and how various thought systems under the heading of Hinduism extended this principle into various aspects of human insight and life. He marveled at what Black Elk's vision of the engagement of all living beings in a, comic, is a, in a cosmic, cosmic dance was. This is what he taught us in a nutshell. There is something missing in the way you're going about your studies, a larger dimension. How can you say you're educated in religious ways if you know little of what Asia has to say? How can you do your speculative, ethical, and biblical and historical studies if you do them in a Christian context without all other traditions? How can you take account of what the Christian context has occasioned in the West without knowing the greater creative scientific tradition. Creative Continuity, one of those essays in Evening Thoughts, edited with the help of Mary Evelyn, he asserted that a sense of developmental time did not exist except in the Western biblical worlds. And even then, it was a spiritual mode of historical development within a given spatial context. This sense of spiritual de development 
gave rise to a cultural coding dominated by historical developmental time as the most primordial aspect of reality. This then provided the context for the scientific technological period with the amazing capacity for transforming the human community and the entire planet. He had found what was missing and they brought them together. Thus, he brought together his cultural studies, his religious studies, and his embrace of earth studies. And he argued that all were needed to face the crisis ahead. This was the insight missing, at least the one not clear, in his first presentation in 1977. Quote, the new story of the universe is a bio-spiritual story as well as a galactic story and an earth story. Thank you. Yep. You have done very well, younger brother. Thank you. <laughs> we keep the Confucian tradition yeah, alive. They treat me with great respect because I'm older than he. Um, the third person I have the honor to introduce, unfortunately, I have not the pleasure to know her before, except today. So, um, I have your, wait a minute, I have it right here. Okay, right here. Uh, Kusumita Pedersen is Professor Merita of Religious Studies at St. Francis College, New York, Chair of the Interfaith Center of New York, and a trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions. She is the co-author of Global Ethics in Practice, Historical Development, Current Issues, and Future Perspective and co-editor of Earth and Faith, a book of reflections for action. A student of Sri Chinoy since 1971, she is completing a study of his philosophy for lesson books. So welcome, and this is your turn. Thank you. Thank you. I, t I, t I, t I timed this at 21 Well minutes. done, that's perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a joy to be here and uh, on this blessed occasion of honoring Thomas Berry. And my uh, paper is called Thomas Berry and the Interfaith Movement, and it should be quite complimentary to what's been said already. In 1956, Thomas Berry was living at the Immaculate Conception Monastery in Jamaica, Queens, New York and had been denied permission by his superiors to either accept an assignment in Japan or to teach. He wrote to his sister Anne, I keep scribbling now and again. Too bad I am involved in such vast areas of study. Twere simpler to be a specialist in some little area of study or to be a poet. <laughs> the worst curse of all is to be a historian interested in the whole world of nations from creation until today. <laughs> this consciousness of the totality of being and the hunger to learn and understand reality comprehensively is an essential driving motive of Thomas Berry's character and vision. The whole world of nations or the global context is located within the far vaster cosmic context indicated by from creation to today. The global context propels us into the encounter of the world's religions and the life of interfaith, while the cosmic context catalyzes our pers perspective on the human as an evolving species among countless other species in the Earth community. Both are aspects of the pan-human. In what follows, I will reflect on their interrelation and the role Thomas played in their recent history, some of which I shared with him. From his childhood, Thomas had been aware of the cosmic context through experience of the sacred mystery or numinous presence in the natural world. 
in seminary, he was formed by spiritual experience of the continuity between the cosmological and the human in the monastic cycle of prayer car corresponding to the times of night and day and the cycle of the seasons. He later said, despite all the trivialization observable in the Catholic tradition, something immensely significant was still available in the carrying out of the age-old effort of humans to bring human life into accord with the great liturgy of the universe, that the universe itself was the primary liturgy, just as it was the primary scripture, I never doubted. During those same seminary years, inquiring into human history through intense study, he had read not only Western philosophical and religious works deeply, certain ones repeatedly, but also studied the Upanishads and the Chinese classics. And this was in the 1930s and early 1940s. At Catholic University, as has been mentioned, he wrote a dissertation on the interpretation of history in a world religious context, examining the philosophy of history in Hindu, Buddhist, and Confucian frameworks. And this was turned down by his advisor as too broad. And he had to write a second dissertation, which was on Gian Battista Vico. Immediately following completion of his doctorate in 1948, he traveled to China. Although he was there for less than a year, it was a life-changing experience, and the beginning of his friendship with William Theodore de Barry on that journey would immeasurably enhance his ongoing study of China. On return from army chaplaincy in Germany, and finally receiving permission to teach, he taught at the Institute for Far Eastern Studies at Seton Hall University, beginning in 1957. In 1959, he began Sanskrit studies at Columbia. And uh, this narrative is demonstrating that he is in, uh, in advance or in a pioneering generation of studying the world's uh, different traditions. In 1956, he had published an essay in World Mission our need of Orientalists. And in 1961, the lead article in the inaugural issue of the new journal, International Philosophical Quarterly. The essay is called Oriental Philosophies and World Humanism. This was the same year that Mircea Eliade um, published History of Religions and a New Humanism as the opening of the inaugural issue of History of Religions. Thomas mentions the work of Eliade with appreciation. In Thomas's lengthy, masterful, rich, and almost encyclopedic essay, Thomas begins by affirming that Oriental philosophy arises from a series of unique spiritual experiences, adding that the dependence of Western philosophy on spiritual experience has been inadequately recognized in a stress on rationality. He discusses Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, and Zen from their beginnings up through the modern period. In closing, he calls for a pluralist world humanism. This is 1961. And states that the challenge to philosophers is essentially the same as the general challenge to mankind in the 20th century, that of giving universal order to human life in all its aspects, and that a total human experience of reality belongs to no one society, but to the world community itself. No one tradition is complete in itself, but taken together, the traditions offer complementary visions which complete each other to illumine reality more fully. And he also observes that having neglected Asian philosophy. The West itself is deeply puzzled about the formation of a world philosophical tradition, which is now a necessity opposed upon us. But more hopefully, he says, diversity is no longer something that we tolerate. It is something that we esteem as a necessary condition for a livable universe. 
as the source of Earth's highest perfection. 1961 was also the year that the University Seminar on Oriental Thought and Religion was founded at Columbia, in which Thomas would offer many papers. I first met him in 1973 when um, I was doing my doctorate in Buddhist studies and I became the graduate student secretary of the seminar and Thomas was the chair. By now, a new chapter in scholarship on the world's religions was well underway. The expansion, expansion in scholarship was partly a result of the Second World War in connection with which governments had promoted the study of different cultures. For some of those who had been posted in Asia in the military, interest in the Orient would become their life's work. Events during World War II also influenced the start of a new phase in interfaith life. Jules Isaac, a French Jew, after the war asked Christian leaders to enter dialogue with the Jewish community to transform those aspects of Christianity that had expedited the Holocaust. This led in time to the historic statement which has been mentioned in detail um, in 1965 of the Second Vatican Council of Nostra Aetate on the relation of Christianity to other religions. As well as growing scholarship and re-examination of the relations among established religions, there was the increase of organized interfaith programs, including centers and councils at the local level. The time was marked also by the growth of spiritual search turning east burgeoning in the 1960s with a number of spiritual teachers coming to the West from India and East Asia. They built on the pre-war influence of Swami Vivekananda and um, D.T. Suzuki and also Paramahamsa Yogananda, author of the autobiography of a yogi. Vivekananda and Suzuki are both mentioned by Thomas in his World Mission essay. As he attends to evolving currents of American spirituality, Thomas spoke of the religions entering their macro phase. For the first time in history, all knowledge about all of the religions is, in principle, available to all. And the religions begin to be fully present to one another. This elicits, Thomas says, the deepest and most numinous elements in each by a psychic attraction and meeting, they enrich each other. I would here like to emphasize that the interplay and at times the convergence of these three developments, scholarship, organized interreligious relations and spirituality is of great historical importance. And Thomas was one of the first to understand this process, as well as to mold it. The global interfaith movement today, made up of thousands, possibly tens of thousands of groups, programs, and activities internationally, is a distinctive development of our time and is one aspect of the great work. In the conclusion to his Religions of India, published in 1971, Thomas articulates a powerful interfaith vision when he says, the global spiritual past is the only adequate context for the present understanding of the human, even though this effort at universal awareness is thwarted by exclusivist attitudes that still exist in the world. Even now, however, the futility of such exclusivism is widely recognized. All live currents of thought seek to encompass the full dimension of the human. Within this larger world of mankind, the multiple spiritual and humanist traditions implicate each other <laughs> and <laughs> complete each other and evoke from each other higher developments of which each is capable. These traditions implicate each other because for each has a universal mission and, uh, to, uh, excuse me, each has a universal mission to humankind and each is pan-human in its significance. Thomas joined the faculty of Fordham University in 1966 and established the History of Religions program. 
Ewart Cousins became one of his colleagues and in 1971, president of the new American Teilhard Association. As in the early 1960s, Fordham had become a center of the study of Teilhard de Chardin. In addition to his interest in Teilhard and theological scholarship, Ewart had a vocation to interfaith dialogue and in 1968 had co-founded the Center for Spiritual Studies with Swami Satchidananda, Edo Tai Shimano Roshi, Rabbi Joseph Gelberman, and Brother David Steindelrost, a Benedictine. Thomas succeeded uh, Ewart as president of the um, American Teilhard Association when in 1975, <coughs> Ewart became one of the main organizers of Spiritual Summit Conference number five of the Temple of Understanding, which had been founded in 1960 by Juliet Hollister. This extraordinary gathering took place at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and the United Nations, with some of the world's most renowned spiritual leaders, including Mother Teresa, Pierre Valaya Khan, the Sufi master, and Hopi elder Grandfather David Monongye. I cherish the photograph of my own spiritual teacher, Sri Chinmoy, offering the opening meditation of the final session in the Dag Hammarskjöld Auditorium at the United Nations. The encounter of the religions calls forth from each other their deepest realizations and gives rise to something more than the sum of their parts, a global spirituality, as your cousins would call it. This was now taking place for Thomas within the cosmic Earth context. Teilhard had been philosophically a portal into this context. Thomas gave importance to three positions in Teilhard's thought. The reality of the psychic as well as the physical in the ontology of the universe. The identity of the human within the cosmological order, within the process of evolution. And a shift in religious focus from redemption to creation. For Thomas, no knowledge can be true if it is partial. And if, it, if not true, it is not life-giving or is not effective, a word he uses quite a lot. Defective knowledge cannot provide meaning, fulfillment, and values for human life in any of its domains, whether social, economic, cultural, or religious, and spiritual. Partial knowledge is trivializing, and incoherent knowledge is dysfunctioning, dysfunctional, producing um, cognitive dissonance. Knowledge must be complete and encompassing, and as Thomas would also say, integral or unifying, embracing the different dimensions of life. If earth and the natural world are neglected, knowledge and experience are not effective, and their failure to be so leads directly to the conscious or unconscious destructiveness that is the root of the current ecological crisis. The primary referent of all knowledge systems must then be the one that is the most comprehensive, the universe, and is thus the most true and the most meaning-filled and life-giving. Thomas is speaking of worldview or cosmovision, a crucial concept in understanding culture and religion. And he recognizes that sto story has always been, for human beings, a central means of conveying worldview um, and some call this kind of primal story myth. <clears throat> Traditional religions have surely spoken of the universe, the creation, and vast reaches of time and space, but in the West, at least, have portrayed a static natural order. The vision of evolution provided by modern science discloses that the physical universe is a process of change, is itself an ongoing story. Yet secular empirical in inquiry has excluded the numinous, the interior, the psychic, or spiritual dimension from its account of this process. The convergence of the cosmological narrative with the age-old power of myth, integrating consciousness and matter, is set forth in Thomas's path pathfinding essay, of course, The New Story. And there he says, a reversal has begun. 
the reality and value of the interior subjective numinous aspect of the entire cosmic order is being appreciated as the basic condition in which the story makes any sense at all. And he says elsewhere, we are in a new position where we can appreciate the historical and the cosmic as a single process. Thomas calls us to unite the ethical, the cognitive, the affective, and the spiritual within the most total cosmic context. This vision is integral and complete in accepting both the inner and the outer aspects of reality, as well as on the unfolding nature of the universe as narrative or story in deep time. As mentioned, Thomas had been concerned with the relation of the world's religions since seminary, and 30 years later in the 1960s and 70s was becoming acquainted with the nascent interfaith movement. As mentioned, I had first met him in 1973, and we continued to meet at the seminar, the Teilhard Association, and at his lectures. In 1983, I quit my job at Notre Dame in the Department of Theology and returning to New York, became the executive director of the Temple of Understanding, which was just mentioned. And after the Temple of Understanding's 1984 Spiritual Summit Conference num um, uh, uh, at the UN, uh, spiritual, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting confused. <laughs> um, in 1984, the Spiritual Summit Conference number five was at the UN in 1975. In 1984, the Temple of Understanding had Spiritual Con Summit Conference number six at um, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and also at the UN. And um, following this, the very Reverend James Parks Morton, Jim Morton or Dean Morton, who was the Dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, became president of the Temple of Understanding. And he asked um, Thomas, to be on the board of the Temple of Understanding. So now he's directly involved in an interfaith organization along with Rabbi Wolf Kelman of Jewish Theological Seminary and Roshi Bernie Glassman. And I then began to see Thomas also in the context of the, this organization. Thomas and his ideas were by now important in certain circles but would soon become more and more widely known. The Dream of the Earth was published in 1988. This was the same year as the Oxford Conference of the New Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders on Human Survival, which was co-founded by the Temple of Understanding and the Global Committee of Parliamentarians on Population and Development. And the 300 plus participants were members of the world's parliaments spiritual leaders of many traditions, including indigenous leaders, and scientists including Carl Sagan, Yevgeny Velikov of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, and Wangari Mathai, Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Runcie, were all there. And the film of the conference in Oxford records Thomas saying, we have to move from democracy to biocracy. <laughs> in the fall of 1989 in Seattle, an interfaith conference on the environment was held called Earth and Spirit. Well, when Thomas Berry appeared on the stage before an audience of 1,000 people, he was received like a rock star. People from across the continent who had read his writings now saw him in person and were thrilled and enraptured. The American Indian elders present spoke of him as a sage. He was the central figure at the conference. I became aware that his message and his influence were spreading and penetrating into our culture in a way I had not fully appreciated before that moment. His ideas and his vision were energizing a movement. Yet Thomas never sought adulation or celebrity in any way. He did not even care for recognition, but only for truth. For the earth 
and for the communion of subjects that is the universe. It is perhaps because of his kenosis, his self-emptying, that his vision attained its revelatory power and that he was able to participate consciously in the community of all life. His constant and uncompromising quest for the most comprehensive, deepest, and most numinous knowledge and experience went hand in hand with an ascetic spirit of self-renunciation he had embraced early in life and progressed to an ever-expanding sense of personhood um, into the cosmic dimension over the arc of his life, as Mary Evelyn and John uh, point out in their biography. In 1993, Thomas attended the centenary parliament of the world's religions in Chicago. With more than 8,000 participants, the closing session outdoors in Grant Park um, had more than 20,000 uh, people there for the Dalai Lama and others. As John Borelli has clarified in their correspondence before we came here, Thomas did not take part in the assembly of spiritual leaders that um, signed, or in some cases refused to sign, the historic declaration toward a global ethic. <coughs> and, um, but Thomas gave a paper on religion in the 21st century in which he gave great importance to the interfaith movement and to the concerted work of the world's religions for the protection and restoration of the earth. And I give to him the concluding words of my presentation. Thomas says, a recovery of the sublime meaning of the universe could lead both to a greater intimacy of the human with the manifestation of the divine in the natural world and to a greater intimacy of the different religions among themselves. Restoration of the sense of the natural world as divine manifestation has special urgency because of the devastation that we are presently causing to the natural world. Only the religion, religious forces of the world with their sense of the sacred can evoke the psychic energies needed to transform a declining Cenozoic era into the emerging Ecozoic era. To initiate and guide this next creative moment of the great story of the earth is the great work of the religions of the world as we move on into the future. Thank you. The three presentations are extremely rich, coming from their personal knowledge of Thomas Berry, as well as their theological, philosophical reflection. We have 10 minutes for conversation. Uh, the light that shines in our face uh, prevents us from seeing anyone. So <laughs> if you want to uh, uh, make, ask a question, please come up here and uh, the, microphone. Uh, the microphone. Yes. So I can, yes, uh, I see the hand going up there. Please. Over here, raise your hand. I see a hand, yeah. Uh, Introduce yourself and uh, ask a question, please. Uh, my name is Joe Holland. I apologize for speaking twice now. I don't like to do that. But um, I, I wanted to, um, I've been thinking about the question I raised last night and listening to today and beginning to have some initial thoughts about what uh, Fletcher Harper called uh, Thomas Perry 2.0. And the challenge that Mary Evelyn and, and John uh, pointed out in this book that Tom presented to Leonardo Boff, no liberation of, of the poor without liberation of the earth, I think has been assimilated within liberation theology, which in turn has become central to Catholic social teaching. And I'd like in a moment just to jump back to John the 23rd about that. Uh, but I think the reciprocity has not gone the other way. The whole social struggle has not been integrated within the, the, the tradition of the Berry, uh, Thomas Berry uh, tradition yet fully. And yet the social struggle is intensifying. Uh, Dan Mishla, I don't know if he's here today, but last night, he was here last night from the Catholic uh, Climate uh, Network. He says, we have 10 years until the earth is cooked. <coughs> so there's an enormous struggle going on in the world. John the 23rd, I believe needs to be, okay. Ask a question, yes. Yeah. 
John the 23rd needs to be understood as the seed, not someone who did not completely understand modernity, but in Modern Magister and Pacham and Terrace, he understood that the modern world was bankrupt ideologically, both on the liberal side and on the, on the social scientific or Marxist side. And he fully understood the cosmological dimension. I just want to, and Pacham and Terrace is grounded in Stoic philosophy, which is the uh, doctrine of cosmopolis. It, this is what he wrote in, in, uh, in uh, so Pacham. Please, please. please. Okay. We, 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 we listen to you right. Could I please, please just read this and then I will stop? No, okay. it's okay. okay. No, right. no, no. Just please ask, ask a question. question. Uh, I just ask. Have you, have, you, uh, examined Pach have you examined Mater and Magistra from a cosmological viewpoint, what John the 23rd wrote there? That's okay, what good. Another one. No, John. I haven't examined Mater and Magistra. I went back, went back and looked at both Pachim and Terrace, as I also looked at Gaudi and Spez. And still, the whole understanding of creation is following human stewardship. It, 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 it has anthropological significance. So. That, you know, it was John the 23rd's uh, encyclical was significant for the way it is dressed to the whole world. He told Pavan to draft it so that both Khrushchev and Kennedy would read it. And so he addressed the nuclear age and nuclear, and that, that's a significant milestone. But Tom, like Tom Berry said, we're still dealing with modernism, we're not dealing with naturalism. And so. I, Next question. John, John. Yes, please. George Soros made recently about a return to globalism. Could anyone on the panel perhaps distinguish the kind of globalism or secular globalism where Thomas was going, I, I'm hearing it. And uh, then also can we uh, make a connection to our current fascination with nationalism? Mm -hmm. And how, do the, how does Tom's globalism relate to the kinds of nationalisms as religion that we're seeing today? Thank you, anyone? My sense is that um, this struggle with nationalism that we're having now, to begin with that, is, uh, is a reaction. It's the same reaction that Thomas Berry had his whole life. How many times were we told, I can do my theology without any reference to other religions? It was a challenge that here it's this man was running a program and people who had been quietly doing their biblical studies and their historical studies and theological studies without any any reference to the larger human context. And in fact, uh, mostly the Jesuits at Fordham didn't appreciate this. And once Thomas was gone, they demoted the program to an MA program. Mm -hmm. I thought it a bit ironic that when I uh, showed up here in 2004, through Fra Frank Clooney's help, a reference from Dan's paper, the Jesuits asked me to manage their interreligious dialogue project in the country, so they, at least they came back to the point. But um, so I think that's part of it. Globalization, you know, uh, we could get really bogged down in intense discussion. I think Thomas Thomas had a sense of this whole historic secular development that Christianity had spawned, and that you could say globalization represents a certain phase. He would see the shortcomings of it with the same shortcomings and everything else, uh, the economic aspects of it and, and the, the, the making the poor even poor in many instances. But I think we're at a point with Laudato Si that's really, I think, you, Joe, your point is good. Laudato Si is making us think of this next phase, the way that the, uh, Pope Francis was able to integrate the social concerns, the concerns of the poor with the concerns of the earth. You want to say something to this? Um, I wonder, John, if George Soros men mentioned the psychic and the numinous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd, I'd also like to say that globalization is something that has already happened, mm -hmm. and we are not in control of it. It has happened. The question is, what are we d doing with it? <laughs> One more question, please. We have three minutes left. Uh, in the back. Yes. I just want to say, that I think this comparison with what Tom Berry's proposal is and what the Catholic Church has done, I mean, we can make comparisons, we can bring in insights together, but I, I think it's undeniable that what, given everything you've said this morning about his wisdom and acumen and knowledge, he's far more radical, far more deep, far more broad than most other thinkers and documents that have come out of the Catholic Church. 
comments? Well, I mean, uh, yes, most, I would say so, but there are those. There are those who struggled. I mean, um, you, you, moving a large institution forward and everything, but he always, somehow he never got investigated, mm -hmm. and he managed to understand how to avoid that, as well as to continue to say these rather radical things. I mean, he really shook up these priests who were mostly assigned to do ecumenical and religious work that it's not that it didn't go far enough, it just didn't understand what it had on its hands, what's going on here. And that's the approach that the people were taking who put that program together in 85, this committee that came together, John was on it, Bill Singner was on it, a number of Tom students. It was such a positive attitude towards these new groups that are showing up in the country that are related to these ancient traditions and to, and to welcome them. So yes, I, I would agree. Monica Helwig, who taught here for, for years, would say there always was this tradition, and Tom saw it, there was a, but at times it was a very weak voice. You can find it running through there. Peter's done a lot of work at bringing this out and showing how it's very loud and clear in Asia. So um, yes, I think there are a lot of things that come out, I, but I think with Pope Francis, we finally have somebody who gets it mm -hmm. and is moving us beyond. And maybe that's why they say it takes 100 years to accept a council. Gerald, you want to, to make, make a final comment? I, th I think that with so many of the things that, th that Thomas spoke about, it takes a while for it to sink in of just how radical it is. Because he, he didn't speak in an angry tone, mm -hmm. with a, a kind of laid back North Carolinian uh, way of talking about it. But in the end, if, if you start to realize, is he really saying that? Mm -hmm. And the implications of it then draw you much further f from that. And in, in, in the way that the tradition is developed, particularly now with the pub republication of so many of these early essays, thank you uh, for that, that we start to see that for even in the very beginning, were the roots that if you followed along and followed the strings with it, you found yourself looking at the necessity of a great work that had to take forth. Uh, before we take the off to go to have a little break, uh, let's say thank you very much for the three speakers this morning.